This is the STS-119 interview with uh, Mission Specialist John Phillips. Um, John, could you, could you, you've probably told this story many times, but one more time for me, if you would. Just tell me how and why you decided to, to become an astronaut. Yeah, I don't mind answering that question again, Andre. Um, first off, I, I'd always been interested in the aviation business. My dad was a, a bombardier in World War II, and I, it, after the war, he became a pilot. He never, uh, he hadn't worked professionally as a pilot in a long time, but I, but I came from a family that was interested in aviation. And then second, when I was about 10 years old, uh, Yuri Gagarin, first man in space, launched just before my 10th birthday. And I decided right then that that's what I wanted to do. And then I grew up in the, you know, in the era of Mercury and Gemini and Apollo, and we were doing some extremely exciting things. And I mean, half, 50 percent of the kids in America wanted to do that, and I was one of them. And once you made that decision, um, there was obvious steps you took to get to, to NASA. Yeah. Can tell us about that. Well, first off, I, I wanted to be a military pilot. And remember, in those days, to be an astronaut, you pretty much had to be a military pilot. Um, it's changed since then. Um, so I decided I wanted to be a Navy pilot, and I went off to the Naval Academy. And um, I majored in math there. And I, I was fortunate that, I, that things like math and engineering came relatively easy, easy to me, and I, was, uh, I just wanted to be as technical as I can and prepare myself for a future high-tech career, not necessarily uh, in the space business, but I always tried to keep an eye on that, on that goal and to keep my, my options open. But my, my immediate goal, though, was to become a Navy pilot, and which, of course, meant four years at the Naval Academy, getting through that, and then going off to flight school and becoming a pilot. A pilot. What would you say um, was the most influential place, person, or maybe event uh, that, that may have impacted you um, and um, kind of shaped your perspective on, on, on life? Well, certainly my, certainly my parents, and as I mentioned, my dad had an aviation background, and he had uh, my brothers and sisters and I somewhat interested or at least observant in the, of the aviation goings on you know, from, from the early day. Um, and then growing up in, the, in sort of the dawn of the space age with the first, first uh, unmanned satellites, I still remember Sputnik and Explorer 1, and then, and then in the dawn of the human sp space flight era, that, w that was very, very important to me. Uh, like I said, a lot of young men and women wanted to do just that at the time, and, and some people set out in that direction, and I was one of them. Uh, and one, one of the things that, that NASA uh, sets out to do uh, is to inspire the next generation of space explorers. Um, how do you think is the best way for, for NASA to do that? What, what, what would you suggest? Well, we can't force it. We can't try to make unexciting things look exciting. What we have to do is do the most exciting things. Do the grand new expeditions and grand new programs, and that's what we're going to be doing in in the next few years when we uh, build a new vehicle, go back to the moon with a with a longer term base, and then go on to Mars. Those things are so exciting that they speak for themselves. Uh, you don't have to try to convince young men and women that's that's the business they should be in. They'll have everybody excited. How big of a uh, part of your life uh, has education been, and and uh, um, what's what's been uh, its its influence on helping you achieve what you have? It's been absolutely essential. Uh, as I mentioned, I went four years to the Naval Academy, had a major in math, and uh, majoring in something like that, uh, like math, leads you leaves you open to to study any hard science, physical science, or engineering later, really. And then uh, when I went back to grad school after ten years in the Navy. I went to UCLA and got a, a master's and a PhD in a, in a field called space physics. And um, basically, at that point, I still had my eye on human space flight. I still wanted to be an astronaut. I knew it was a long shot. But I knew also I wanted to work in science. So I, I found an area of science that was interesting to me and set off down that path, all the while thinking, well, maybe this will help me be an astronaut. That I never bet everything on being an astronaut, but certainly, the education enabled me to do interesting work, um, to, to achieve my goals in, in science, and eventually to be an astronaut. Tell me what it was like um, 
going on your first space flight, just the, the whole, whole experience from, from start to beginning. Just kind of give me, tell me, give me an overview of what it, what, what it was like. Well, first off, understand that it was something I wanted to do for a very long time. My first uh, launch into space was a few days after my 50th birthday. And I had my eye on this since I was about 10. Mm -hmm. So it was the culmination of something I wanted to do for a very long time. So there was that. There was the, um, the idea that uh, I finally uh, accomplished this thing that I really wanted to do. Um, for all astronauts, when you launch, I think the major thing that's on your mind is doing your job properly. Don't let me make a big mistake that's going to jeopardize the mission or let my crewmates down. So there's some pressure on you. But at the same time, particularly for a first flight, it's a big relief. You know, I finally made it to space. The, the launch itself, um, I was with a great bunch of guys, and, and they, they supported me all the way and helped me when I was having trouble, and hopefully I did the same for them. And uh, it was a great bunch of guys to train with and to launch with. The launch itself is um, not as as dynamic in some ways as the flying I did off, off a Navy ship. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't kick you in the pants quite as hard as a catapult shot and, you know, or, or an arrested landing. You know, the, the vehicle kind of lumbers into the air kind of slowly with a bit of shaking. And so in a physical amusement park kind of sense, it was nothing as, uh, as dynamic as other things I've done. But just the overall scale of things and, and, and seeing how, how big the rocket is, how big the workforce is, how many thousands of people are supporting that mission is really awesome. Um, and that maybe is one of the things that I, um, that I took home from it most is that the big picture of what we do is really big. I um, mean, there are a whole lot of people and a whole lot of companies and a whole lot of facilities supporting what we do. When you did get a chance to look down on, on the Earth, um, however brief period of time that was, how did that impact you? Well, first off, it's beautiful, and, you, and all astronauts will say that. You also get uh, a very immediate feeling of how fragile our, our biosphere is. Uh, it's supported by an atmosphere that, when, even from low Earth orbit, looks very thin and tenuous. Um, and you, you see the sort of connections of the Earth as a whole better than you do here on Earth. Um, a lot of people don't have a good idea of what, of what we can see from space, and a lot of people have the wrong idea of, of where we are. They think we're out near the moon, whereas, in, in fact, we're actually quite close to the surface of the Earth. But when you look out the window, you can see something of, of the, the scale of what you can see is about the size of an average U.S. state. Maybe you can see the state of Colorado, the whole state. You can't see the entire country. Um, and so you see medium scale things going on, like medium scale weather. You don't see the, the, the whole Earth at once, nor do you see little tiny local things. But I find it a very interesting scale to look at, to see the Earth at that scale and see um, there's the river and there's the desert and there are certain land boundaries and political boundaries. So, uh, so it's, it's really one of the funnest things about being an astronaut is looking down at the Earth. We, we talked briefly about um, uh, the, the uh, people who work behind the scenes. They, they're an extension of, of every mission. Um, they, they do the work. They're unsung heroes. What's it like when you get a chance to meet those people um, uh, and, and, and get a chance to talk to them? Well, there are kind of two levels of it. Well, first off, I think of us as we're the, we're, the astronauts are the, are the lucky people who get to ride the rocket. We've got the glamour job. We get our names in the paper. We have a lot of fun. But there are for every one of us, there are a thousand people who are just as educated or, or skilled or, or, or diligent or dedicated to their work. And now some of those people are in places like Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center who often work with astronauts who are really keyed into when, they, when the mission's going, they know what, what our goal is and what our, which orbiter is going. And, and it's very exciting to talk to those people and share your first-hand experiences. Then there are other people who are somewhat more removed. Um, they might work for a subcontractor to a subcontractor to a major contractor like Boeing or Lockheed. They might be a small contractor that in some completely distant part of the city, uh, part of the country, who have only the vaguest idea of what their product is doing. And there it's really exciting because it's uh, when I talk to these people, like for example, on a factory floor of a factory that makes some, some gadget for us, uh, maybe I'm the first astronaut they've ever met. Maybe I'm the first person who's given them a presentation on, on what we're doing up there and what, what their part 
did, mm -hmm. the thing they made. And that I find really rewarding to talk to those people who don't get much of an everyday connection to our business. Uh, you were also a uh, science officer uh, and flight engineer on board ISS for uh, Expedition 11. Um, first of all, what was it like living and working in space for that period of time? Um, I like long duration space flight. Uh, I've had one shuttle flight, one station flight, and I'm about to go on another shorter station, uh, shuttle flight. And I, all other things being equal, which of course they're not, I would choose the long duration mission. I like the fact that you're not always in a hurry which you are on a shorter mission, you're really working against the clock. Um, if, some, if you don't get a certain job done in the morning, it's okay to do it in the afternoon. Um, if you're going over a part of the earth that you're interested in, you, you can take the time out and open a window and get a camera and get pictures of what you're interested in. Um, you also get a feel for living and working in space that you don't on a short flight. You become skilled in maneuvering in, in weightless conditions. Um, you get, and another thing that people aren't aware of on, uh, who aren't really familiar with our program is that when you're up there, up there for six months you see changes in the earth and in the orbit that really affect uh, what things look like to you. You see changes of the season, you see changes of um, the, the angle between the sun, the earth, and the spacecraft that affect sometimes the, the direction we're flying, I mean the direction we're pointing, and you see uh, sometimes we're, we see sunset for, for an entire orbit or sunrise for an entire orbit. Sometimes we see uh, 45 minutes a night and 45 minutes a day. Actually, we never see quite that. Sometimes we see like 48 and 43. And sometimes the days are longer than the nights by quite a lot. And you see a lot of different things on Earth. So I like the fact that being on a long mission, you see those changes and you have time to enjoy them. When I came back from a long duration trip on the space station in 2005, and even more recently, people often ask me how many experiments did I do on, while I was up there. And, and I'm, I know people will ask me after, after this flight. And we did, in fact, do conventional science experiments. And we're going to be carrying up and down conventional science experiments on this flight. But the way I used to think about it, and the way I usually answer this question, you know, how many experiments do you do? It's one. Because to me, the whole thing is an experiment. Uh, the hardware design that was done in Russia and the United States and Germany and, and, and Japan uh, and Italy, that's an experiment. The, the traditional science experiments that we carry on out there are an experiment. The life support equipment is an experiment. How we, how we keep ourselves healthy up there is an experiment. The mission control concepts with mission control um, uh, centers all over the world, that's an experiment. And even the, even the money and the, and the political partnerships and the budgeting, that's an experiment. So I think of it as one big experiment. I'm proud to have been a part of it. And I think all the taxpayers of America and Russia and Europe and Japan and Canada should be proud of it too. Uh, what are you anticipating most about your, your return to ISS on, on this mission? And it's, it's well, well, you know, the, the first time I went in 2001, and the second time I went in 2005, the station itself hadn't changed much. Uh, two airlocks had been added, an American airlock and a Russian airlock, but otherwise it looked pretty much the same. Um, when I go back for my third trip, uh, the interior volume of the station has roughly doubled in size. There are a whole lot of laboratory equipment and a lot of spaces in there that I have never seen and don't really know much about. In addition, the external power uh, uh, trusses, which we're going to complete, um, are much more are much bigger. They're, they're all they will be all up there. When I was up there before, there was only one of the four, mm -hmm. and so the station is way bigger. It's much more capable, and um, it, to me, it'll be uh, it'll be very exciting. It'll be like visiting a new place in a way. And yet, at the same time, there'll be some some places that are very old and comforting to me that I've seen before. Let, let, let me ask you this. You make me think yeah. of something else. Uh, um, ISS has has been given, a, I guess, a finite term of existence. Uh, so was Hubble. <laughs> yeah. Hubble's still going. Um, how do you think ISS will, will, will fare compared to the, the lifespan that it's been given? I don't really know. Uh, in NASA, uh, we have a long tradition of extending missions much beyond their, their original lifetime. I was involved with the Ulysses science 
spacecraft project, which just met its demise very, very recently after working about three times as long as it was supposed to. And then there are, of course, the early voyagers and pioneers that we're still talking to after many years. Um, I hope we keep the space station up there as long as it's still returning good science. Um, eventually, the next program comes along, and, and if it can compete for, compete for resources is basically what usually kills, us, it kills one of these spacecraft projects. You just can't afford the care and feeding anymore. And I'm hoping that we can continue the care and feeding of the space station uh, long after we start flying the Constellation project and, and maybe even until we're ready to go back to the moon, which is you know another 10 or more years away. So I'm thinking that the space station, we will continue operating the space station at least another 10 years, but I don't really know. What's it been like working uh, with these crewmates uh, as you've trained for this mission? Uh, tell me about some of the relationships and, and some of the skills you've seen in some of your crewmates. Well, I don't know, know if you've noticed, but of the, uh, of the six of us on the, on, the, on the core shuttle crew, four of their names begin with A. So people have called us the A team, but I'm one of the ones whose name doesn't begin with A. <laughs> anyway, they, they're guys that I knew, a, a few that I knew relatively well, a few that I knew less well. Um, they've been a great bunch of guys to work with. Uh, we have different levels of experience. Our commander and MS-2 have flown once before. Our Japanese astronaut and myself have flown twice before. And then we've got three rookies. And they're um, different personalities, different backgrounds, great bunch of guys to be with, all have a sense of humor. Nobody's too serious, and yet they're all serious enough to get the job done. So um, I couldn't ask for a better crew. Uh, one of the things uh, your crew will be doing is, is delivering uh, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata to the station. Uh, he'll become JAXA's uh, first long-duration uh, astronaut on board ISS. Uh, what are your thoughts about having a, a, a small part in, in uh, reaching that milestone for that space agency? Oh, actually, it's wonderful for me. I have a, a, a long relation with a couple of academic institutions in Japan. I've, I've spent a sabbatical there. I've been to Japan quite a few times. And um, I've worked with Japanese astronauts. We had two of them in my astronaut class. Well, when Koichi goes up, um, you know, he'll be the first Japanese astronaut to fly three times. He'll be the first to do a long duration. I believe, and I'm not 100% sure about this, but he'll be the first person to drive four different robot arms. That's a little known first. And um, I am. I think it's exciting to get another major international partner fully on board in the station program with a, with a full participation. They've got their brand shiny new lab. They're going to have a brand new robot arm up there. And um, I think the Japanese participation is absolutely key to what we do. I wish I was going to be up there when their first um, HTV, their transfer vehicle, comes up, but that'll be a little after, after my time. Um, this whole experiment we're doing, this international um, space station, which I consider the whole thing to be an experiment, is, is, has its bedrock on international cooperation. Uh, we couldn't do it alone, nor could the Russians, nor could the Europeans, nor could the Japanese. And um, I think every, time, every milestone for one of our international partners is a milestone for the partnership as a whole. So I think it's wonderful to have Koichi on board. Uh, could you summarize for me, please, what, what the main goals uh, of the mission are? Okay, there, there's one real overriding goal. I mean, what's our payload? Well, part of our payload is Koichi Wakata, taking him to station and taking Sandy Magnus home. But the real fundamental payload that we're carrying is called the S-6 truss. And it's the final piece of the, uh, the American electro, uh, electrical power generating truss assembly. And it's been a long time coming. Uh, the, first, the first piece was launched roughly early 2001, if I remember right. And now we're going to complete it. When you look at pictures of the station now, it looks very asymmetric. But we're going to complete the symmetry. So we're going to do, this, is, this is almost 16 tons. It fills up the entire payload bay of the shuttle. We're going to deliver that and install it and deploy it. That is, unfold the solar arrays and complete the power generation part of, of the uh, US segment of the, of the space station, which will enable all these brand new labs, the Japanese lab and the European lab, to have the power they need to do the experiments they're going to do. And as a mission specialist uh, on this crew, what, what are some of your key roles and responsibilities on this mission? Well, I'm sort of the lead crane operator for the, the station, the space station robot arm. Now, 
The space shuttle carries a robot arm, but that arm by itself cannot pick this truss out of the of the um, of our payload bay and install it. So what we have to do is um, Sandy Magnus and I driving the space station robot arm will pick the truss up out of the payload bay. Then we will hand it off to the space shuttle robot arm. And they will hold it for us while the little railroad car that our robot arm is based on moves out to another position uh, way out on the starboard side of the station. Then we're going to grab it back from them and position it for installation, position this new truss for installation way out on the extreme starboard end of the existing truss structure. And then at the same time, actually it's the next morning, uh, EVA team is going to go outside and they're going to be standing by right there at the, at the interface between the old truss that's installed now and the new one that we're bringing. And we're going to bring them together and then they're going to bolt those, the, the truss uh, together um, and, uh, and do a bunch of other manipulations to, to allow it to unfold the solar blankets. Uh, tell me a little bit about how would you characterize uh, the work that the STS-126 crew did on the starboard side uh, solar alpha rotary yeah. joint and, and how that impacts the relevance of your, your mission? Well, the solar alpha rotary joint uh, basically rotates a large se section of the U.S. solar power arrays. And right now there are two what we call solar array wings. There are two of them outboard of that truss, uh, outboard of that rotary joint. So when you rotate the joint, two of these solar, solar array wings move. We're going to add another two out there. So the effectiveness of the truss structure that we're bringing and its solar panels depends uh, absolutely on the ability to rotate this joint. Now what the, uh, the previous crew, the spacewalkers on the previous crew did, was they basically cleaned up the damage that had been done. There was, there was a lot of small metal debris on the bearing of this, um, on the, the bearing and race ring mm -hmm. of this old, of the uh, rotor joint. They cleaned it up and they installed some new bearings. They didn't quite complete the bearing installation job, but they did most of it. And I, as from what I've read, it was a great success and it has restored most of the functionality of that rotary joint. Maybe not 100%, but most of it. So we will still be able to, once we deploy our solar panels, the controllers on the ground will be able to command that rotary joint to position the solar panels square onto the sun where they, where they generate um, most of their electrical power. On, on flight day one, you guys will, will launch on board Discovery and uh, configure and check out systems for your stay in space. Um, then there's a limited inspection on, on flight day two of the shuttle's exterior. Can you kind of tell us about that procedure? Well, first off, that inspection is, is a piece of the, um, the overall scheme of, of checks of the, orbit, of the integrity of the orbiter thermal pr protection system. Mm -hmm. And we put a big scheme in place after the Columbia accident. And that includes uh, photography from the ground, includes photography from the space station. And in this particular event, we, we, we have a boom called the orbiter boom sensor system that we pick up with a shuttle robot arm and it's got laser sensors and other cameras on board and we do very we fly the space shuttle robot arm carrying this boom uh, along the surface of the, uh, of the shuttle taking detailed pictures and doing detailed laser scans now I am not a shuttle robot arm operator so I'm the number three guy for this task when we do the inspection of the of the of the starboard and port wing panels and so I'm basically operating some computers and some sensors while we're doing this inspection. The real key, though, is the guys on the ground who are analyzing these data. Because uh, for us, we're, you know, we're driving the arm and, and operating the sensors, but we're not analyzing the data. And so all these, the data get telemetered down to the ground, and then a team of people in a photogrammetry lab, and I think other labs here at JSC, do really detailed um, uh, analysis, and they can figure out if there was a if there was a small hole in a panel, just how big it was and how dangerous it was, or if there was a little bit missing from a, a, one of the tiles, you know, how deep is the hole in the tile and whether that's dangerous. And that's going to affect the rest of our mission. 
Uh, the next day is the first of uh, several very busy days for both uh, your crew on board Discovery and the crew on ISS. Um, tell us about the activities planned for the rendezvous and docking phases of the mission and uh, highlight what you'll be doing during, during that time. Well, I'm the rendezvous mission specialist. Most of the time, the commander and pilot and myself are up on the flight deck. There are other times when, uh, when Joe Acaba is up there, and there are other times when uh, Steve Swanson and Ricky Arnold and, and Koichi Wakata are up there as well. But for much of it, it's the three of us, um, Tony and Lee and I, and, and we're, um, we're, we're basically driving the orbiter in to, to rendezvous with the space station. And it's, I think of it in, in kind of two pieces. The first of it is uh, what I would say is open loop, that we, fi we fire a lot of our maneuvering and uh, rocket system and our reaction control system to, to guide the trajectory in to a, a distance of a few miles away, or really actually about a thousand feet away. And then there comes a point where, where we take over and, and do manual flying. And, uh, and this may surprise people, but when, we, when the shuttle actually docks, there's not much that's automated about it. The commander is actually driving the vehicle. Um, but my job through much of this is to make sure that the commander and pilot have the information they need. We have a sensor suite on the, on the shuttle that involves a, a LIDAR ranging sensor that's built into the shuttle payload bay and, and can measure um, distance to the space station. We also have a rendezvous radar. We also have a handheld laser, sort of like you know, police uh, speed trap mm -hmm. that I'll operate. And to make sure that the, um, the commander and pilot have the range and angle information they need to precisely fly us into a rendezvous. Uh, you, you touched on, on uh, the flight day four activity of getting uh, S6 out of the payload bay and into position, into the overnight park position. That's um, right. what, is, what, is the, what options do you have if, for instance, um, in the unlikely event that one of the robotic arms fails? That's, uh, that's a very interesting question. And um, first off, we cannot install this truss without the space station robot arm. Uh, we just can't do it. Fortunately, the space station robot arm has built-in redundancy. It has multiple ways to get power to it. It has ways to operate it in a degraded mode if you lost one particular joint or one particular black box. So we're pretty confident that will keep working. Now, the shuttle robot arm also pays, plays a, a key role because we have to hand the truss back to the shuttle robot arm in order to move the railroad car on which the station arm is based out to where it needs to be. Um, there are ways, if we had a shuttle robot arm problem, there are ways we can work around it. And it's pretty complicated and would involve a lot of real-time analysis by folks on the ground. But for example, you could park, um, you could perhaps temporarily park this truss on, on a part of the station. And, and uh, if that happened, well, it would be a, it would be a bad day. It, it would be... Uh, a day that would require a lot of work from a lot of people to come up with a new plan. Um, and in the end, I think we'd still get it installed and it would be probably one of our finest hours. Um, talk a little bit more uh, uh, about EVA-1, installing the truss. Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about it. Um, tell me um, what you'll be doing specifically and uh, talk about the, the assistance you'll get from the EVs um, okay. out near the truss. Well, the, um, what Koichi Wakata and I will be doing is taking this truss, which we have stationed on the robot arm, just a little bit outboard, a little bit further starboard than the existing starboard truss, and we'll be bringing it in very close to the, um, we'll be bringing the new truss in very close to where it mates to the old truss. Then the EVA, that's at the same time the, the EVA crewmen are going out. That's two EVA crewmen, and they will be right there, and they, they are going to give us um, find guidance to bring it in because we've got to line up four bolts with four holes mm -hmm. and they're going to give us fine guidance you know a little bit a little bit to the right a little bit pitch up that kind of guidance and we'll bring it in and at that point most of the action is it's the EVA guys are doing most of the work they've got to bolt the trusses together and once that's complete we're going to back the we're going to ungrapple or ungrab the um, the truss for the robot arm and we're going to back out and then we're kind of out of the picture for the rest of that EVA. And the, and the EVA guys are doing the work. They're unfolding the pieces of the truss that hold the solar panels. And, and they've got to hook up a bunch of wires and a bunch of, bunch of beams and, 
and uh, it's kind of a complicated um, activity that leads to our real the real crux of our mission a few days later when we open the solar array wings. Uh, if mission managers decide uh, they'd like to take a closer look at Discovery, um, you'll do a, a focused inspection on flight day six. Um, That's correct. Tell us um, how you do that, if, if it does happen. Well, this is quite complicated. And focused inspection, we don't know exactly what we'd be looking for or where on the orbiter we'd be looking. But for the most part, we would be using, once again, the shuttle robot arm and the, and the uh, orbiter boom sensor system. Now. Unfortunately, once the shuttle is docked, the shuttle robot arm cannot grab that boom. It just doesn't have enough elbow room, basically. It would have to stick its elbow through a module to do it. So that means we have to grab that boom and pull it off, the, off its resting place on the shuttle with a station robot arm. Well, as I mentioned, the railroad car that the station robot arm rides on is, is about as far to the starboard side of the station as you can get. Uh, it had to be there to, to reach our truss point. So we've got to move that whole railroad car back. And then we've got to, um, then we, then we uh, Koichi Wakata and I working together use the space station robot arm to grab this boom off the shuttle and hand it to the shuttle robot arm. And then the, the guys driving the shuttle robot arm basically do the inspection. And at the end of the day, day they hand it back to us and we put, it, we put the boom back on the shuttle. So my role in it is basically to to get the boom out of the shuttle and hand it off to the station, uh, to the shuttle robot arm, okay. and then in reverse at the end of the day. There is a chance that you might not do a focused inspection on the day it's been timelined for. Um, uh, it's my understanding that if that is the case, you'll uh, move one of the major activities for the mission up uh, to give you more time to actually do that. Yeah. That's right, Andre. Um, we are hoping we won't have to do a focused inspection, and usually they have not been required. And if one is not required, then what I consider to be the real crux of our whole of our whole flight, which is the deployment of the solar arrays, will be moved forward on the schedule. Deployment means we open up the solar panels, basically, so they can catch sunlight. Okay, can you uh, give us some an overview of how that event will happen once once you do yeah. um, take it off? Well, there are two solar array wings, and they are. Um, and each of them has two solar blankets, two big, long solar panels. So there's four solar panels in all, and they are in what's called blanket boxes, these complicated metal boxes. And the ground preps the whole thing. Um, the ground unlocks the boxes and does a lot of checks. And then they turn it over to us, and we've got the entire shuttle crew working on this. We've got 12 TV monitors up looking at different views. We've got one guy on the shuttle, six guys on the station. And, I, and, and it's a big team effort. When we unfold these arrays, um, they're coming out of the boxes and they're, and they're pleated together and the pleats are flattening as they come out of the boxes. And um, you, you don't want to put too much tension on them, but you have to put enough tension on them to unfold them. And um, we've learned some lessons over the years in how to do these. This is, should be the final such operation in the history of the station, I hope. And uh, so we've got six people stationed around monitors on the station, one on the shuttle. We, two guys are just watching the, the tensioning devices uh, on, the, on the boxes that the arrays are coming out of. Uh, two people are counting the number of bays or the, or the number of panels that have unfolded. I'm the guy who pushes the button that says deploy. And, uh, and, if, and then we will deploy each solar array wing halfway out. And then I will abort that deploy. And then we, uh, we do this during orbital daytime. And it takes about five minutes to do half the array. And then we've got about 30 minutes to bake it out, where we let the sun get on it, and it's, it will keep the panels from sticking together. And then we deploy the rest of the way. And then the next solar day, we do the other side. This is the fourth time we've deployed solar, uh, solar panels. But what's very interesting is that these have been in the boxes for a long time. Mm -hmm. One side has been in the box for five years, the other side about eight years. And during that time, they haven't been taken out and stretched out. Now, the, the folks at Kennedy Space Center have taken some, some measures to minimize problems that might occur, but we're still anticipating that, that, that some of these pleated together panels might stick and not come apart so easily. Uh, assuming S6 um, um, is installed successfully and its solar arrays deployed, um, you'll turn your attention to some other hardware on EVA-3. Um, tell That's us a little correct. bit about what, what's going to happen on that EVA. Well, um, I'm once again the, the robot arm operator along with Koichi Wakata. 
and uh, the two EV crewmen will go out and their first task will be to move what's called a CETA cart. CETA, C-E-T-A is an acronym, I forget what it stands for, but there are these two utility carts uh, that sit on either side of the, of the railroad car that the robot arm is on. And in order to get the robot arm um, as far to starboard as we needed to for our operation to, to install the solar, um, uh, the solar uh, truss, mm -hmm. we had to put both of these cars on the port side of the railroad car, and that was done on a previous flight. But then when we're done, we have to move one of them back to the starboard side for some operations that will happen in the next flight. And so the, the EV crew first has to move, a, move one of these carts, which involve guy actually holding this cart weighing hundreds of pounds in his hand. He's got his feet anchored into a, um, basically a foot restraint on the end of the robot arm, and Koichi and I will, will fly him straight away from the truss, and he pulls, pulls the cart off the truss. The other EVA crewman is disconnecting it, and then we move him to the other side of the station, and, and he mates it back in place. So we take him for a very long ride, on which the only thing he can see is this cart, right, <laughs> a foot in front of his face. So once that cart is relocated, then one of the EV crewmen is going to go off and do something that doesn't involve robot arm operations. He's going to be basically change some boxes of electrical relays that have been having some problems elsewhere on the station. Uh, meanwhile, Koichi and I will take one of the robot arm operators to the new Canadian-built robot called Dexter, also known as a special purpose um, dexterous manipulator, mm -hmm. and it's been on the station since February. Um, but the installation was wasn't quite complete when uh, when the first crew when the crew brought it up there in February. They've got a couple of uh, thermal blankets that we have to remove or adjust. So I'm going to be flying the robot arm when when Ricky Arnold goes in uh, on the arm right up to this robot and and uh, removes a, a thermal blanket and adjusts another one. And then we're going to take Ricky, and he's going to get off the arm, and he's going to be on the side of, the, of one of the trusses of the station, and we're going to bring what's called the end effector, that's sort of the, the hand of the robot arm, right up to his face. And he's going to have a grease gun and some pliers, and he's going to work with what's called snare wires, which are sort of the active component of, this end of, of the end effector, to lubricate them and, and, and move them around and take pictures of them. Uh, they've been up there since, since my crew brought them up in STS-100 in 2001, they will have been up there almost seven, or almost eight years, and uh, it's about time to do a little preventive maintenance on them. After your work on ISS is done, uh, you and your crewmates will eventually depart station. Um, you'll get a chance as you're pulling away to, to see ISS with a fully built-out truss and all of its solar arrays uh, deployed. Uh, that, how do you think it's going to make you feel to know that your contribution is going to allow uh, this craft to do more for more people in the future? Well, it's going to be a great feeling to walk, to, to be flying away and seeing this huge, beautiful space station. And we'll be taking pictures like crazy, and it'll make me feel good to know that I had a piece of the action. To know that eight years before we helped put the robot arm up there, and now we helped put this truss up there, and it's the place I lived. At the same time, it'll be a little sad because I may never get there again, and. Uh, and after three trips there, and knowing that I may never see it again, it'll be a little sad. But it'll be with, with great pride, I think, that, um, that I, help, I help build this guy. I mean, it's the, one of the grandest engineering pro projects in the history of humankind. And to know that you had an important role in it.